In this video, we'll work through a simple, silly example with real numbers to demonstrate how to calculate the receiver operating characteristic curve, also known as the ROC curve for short. It's an enormously useful metric for quantifying the performance of a binary classification model. Okay, to understand how to calculate the ROC metric, let's work through not a real example, but <laughs> an example with real numbers. So let's say we have a situation where a binary classifier has made four predictions. And these predictions are as to whether a hot dog is in an image or not. So in these four images, this column Y shows the real state of the world, the true state of the world. So there are two images with a hot dog labeled as one and two images without a hot dog labeled as zero. Our algorithm when presented with those images provides us with four predicted outcomes or four outputs. And here they are. So in this situation here, it has the least confidence that there is a hot dog in the image. In this situation here, it has the most confidence. To calculate the receiver operating characteristic, we take the numbers from the preceding slide and we do some computations. So here I've simply rewritten what we had on the previous slide. We have the real world situation, hot dogs or not hot dogs, labeled as ones and zeros respectively, and then our y hat, our model's prediction as to whether a hot dog is present or not. So the first step is to consider this point here, this point three, the lowest y hat value as the threshold as to whether this is a hot dog or not. So at that threshold, we consider everything below 0.3 or at 0.3 and below <laughs> to be a zero, to be a classification of zero. Whereas anything above 0.3, we consider that to be a prediction that a hot dog is there. And then we work through each of those scenarios and determine whether that is correct or not. So some of these are true positives. So situations where the algorithm predicts that a hot dog is present and it's true that a hot dog is. In another situation, we have a situation where the algorithm predicts that this is not a hot dog and it really isn't a hot dog. So that's a true negative. And then we finally have this situation here where the algorithm is predicting that it's a hot dog at this 0.3 threshold. So a y hat of 0.6 is above 0.3. So our algorithm is saying, yes, at this threshold, I predict that there is a hot dog here, but in fact, there is not a hot dog there. So this is a false positive. We then repeat this procedure at all of the thresholds, except for the very top one. And you'll kind of see why when we get through these. So let's go to 0.5 first. So now we consider 0.5 to be the threshold. Anything at 0.5 or below is considered to not be a hot dog, and anything above 0.5 is considered to be a hot dog. So this only flips one of the predictions. So this true positive stays the same, this false positive stays the same, this true negative stays the same. The only one that's changed is this one here, where previously this was a correct classification, a true positive, but now we have a situation where our algorithm is saying, no, I don't predict there to be a hot dog here, but in fact, there is one. So this is a false negative. Then we do the same thing again as we did at 0.3 and 0.5 for the 0.6 threshold. So now here, anything that is at 0.6 or lower is considered to be not a hot dog. And anything that is above 0.6 is considered to be a hot dog. So now again, this true negative is the same as before. This false negative is the same as before. This true positive is the same as before. It's just this one prediction that is flipped. And in this situation, it is now correct for the first time. So at the other two thresholds, it was incorrect. But now in this situation here, this y hat of 0.6 is considered to be a negative by the algorithm. So it predicts that a hot dog is not there. And that's true. There isn't a hot dog there. So this is now a true negative. And so, yeah, so that wraps up this kind of first stage of calculating the ROC metric. The last point here is that we don't go through this at the 0.9 threshold because there's no point in doing it there because we'd be considering everything to be negative and 
there's no purpose there. We want there to at least be one negative case or one positive case for our algorithm as we go through this exercise. Okay, so having done this part, we can now move on to the next part, which is calculating the true positive rate and the false positive rate at each of these thresholds. So to do that, we follow this relatively simple formula. The true positive rate is number of true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So in this column, we have two true positives. We put that in the numerator. And in the denominator, it's still two because we don't have any false negatives at this point. So two divided by two gives us a true positive rate of one at this 0.3 threshold. The false positive rate is given by false positives over false positives plus true negatives. Altogether, these two rates capture all four of the possible situations. So true positive, false negative, true negative, false positive. Those are the four possible outcomes, and they're all captured in these two rates. Going through the numbers here for the false positive rate, we have one false positive. In the numerator, we have a false positive and a true negative. So one divided by two gives us 0.5. We do the same thing for the 0.5 threshold. So now we have one true positive, um, but we also have a false negative. So now our uh, true positive rate is 0.5. Our false positive rate is the same. At this final threshold, we have a same true positive rate as at the previous threshold, but our false positive rate has changed it went from 0.5 to 0 because now we no longer have any false positives here. We just have two true negatives in the denominator. So 0 divided by 2 gives us 0. So then what we do with each of those values is we plot them on a curve. So we take the true positive rates and the false positive rates from this table, and we consider them to be a coordinate. So we have a coordinate of TPR 1.0 and FPR 0.5, and we can take that and put that on our curve. So TPR of 1.0 and FPR 0.5 corresponds to this point here. And then similarly 0.5 and 0.5, that goes right here. And finally 0.5 and zero goes right here. And then we also add an extra coordinate at zero, zero and one, one, and then we interpolate between those points, and we consider that to be the receiver operating characteristic curve. And our objective is to have an algorithm that fills as much of the space under this curve as possible. So with our made up data points, our model currently has a area under the curve of 0.75. So we can say an ROC AUC a receiver operating characteristic area under the curve of 0.75. Now, is 0.75 good? Well, here's a quick guide. So we'd expect a area under the curve of 0.5 by chance. So if you just randomly guess with a binary classifier, you should get random performance. And that corresponds to an area under the curve of 0.5, a curve that follows right along this diagonal here. If your algorithm is above chance, then it will cover more space than just 0.5. And the closer that the algorithm is to filling in the entire space, the better it's performing. If it manages to fill up 100% of the area under the curve, then it is performing perfectly. So at every single one of the thresholds, it is correctly classifying true positives and true negatives. So you have no false positives and no false negatives at any point on the curve. Now, the final piece of the puzzle here is how to calculate the area under the curve, and we can do that with integral calculus. So that's the ROC curve, which confers far more nuance on a binary classification model's performance relative to simpler metrics like classification accuracy. To be sure not to miss the next video in this series, subscribe to my channel. Thanks for taking part in this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and comment. To be sure not to miss any of my content, head to johncrone.com and sign up for my email newsletter.
You're also welcome to add me on LinkedIn. Simply mention that you're a viewer of the Machine Learning Foundation series. And finally, you can follow me on Twitter too if that's your social medium of choice.